In today's King James False Friends video, I tell one of the funniest stories you will ever hear about Bible translation. But because it involves what has become a dirty word, I didn't have the guts to put it in my book, Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible, or in my Faith Life documentary of the same name. But today, if you stick around till the end of the video, I will tell the story, I promise. It still makes me crack up every time I even think of it. It's an absolute classic. Not safe for kids' ears, but something I think adults actually need to hear, for reasons I'll explain. Everybody who grew up on the King James Version, as I certainly did, knows about those naughty words that cause the teens in Sunday school to titter during Bible reading time. I'm actually particularly persnickety about the use of bad words in my personal life. Words that take the Lord's name in vain, especially I never utter, but also words that profane the marriage bed, or words that otherwise bring the properly private into public, or words that are offensive to particular ethnic groups, my kids will tell you that I am very strict about such bad words. We just do not do potty talk or casual racism. So it feels extremely awkward for me to even mention some of the bad words in the King James Version that I'm about to discuss. And actually, my discomfort raises the central question of my video. Did the original readers of the 1611 King James Version, this is the 1769, did they experience this same discomfort? Did the King James translators choose some words that they full well knew were widely offensive? Or were they then neutral words which only later picked up nasty connotations? I'm not going to ask you what you think our five words mean because I think you know. And here I've just got to say them and get it over with. Bastard, pisseth, whore, bowels, and ass. Bastard. Bastard is a word that appears in the King James three times. For example, a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to his tenth generation. Deuteronomy 23.2. But this is a word that, by the time the RSV translation comes along in the 1950s, appears only once. And after that, translations basically dropped it completely. No major modern evangelical English Bible translation uses this word today. They all tend to opt for illegitimate children instead. Why? I'll actually just talk about the New Testament use of this word for time's sake, though the Old Testament word is similar. The Greek New Testament word translated bastard in the King James Version means illegitimate children, someone born out of wedlock or of servile origin and therefore without legal status or rights. Older Greek dictionaries do offer the translation bastard sometimes for this Greek word, but by the time bedag rolls around in the early 2000s, that nasty word is absent. Bedag gives illegitimate, baseborn. That's because it's obvious to anyone who's spoken English for any length of time that bastard now doesn't often get used to mean illegitimate child. And even when it does, there's still a strong whiff of nastiness in the word. Much more commonly, the word is just a mean name. It means, according to my New Oxford American Dictionary, which describes contemporary English, an unpleasant or despicable person. The New Oxford gives the example sentence, He lied to me, the bastard. And when I checked an online corpus, uses of nosy bastard and cheap bastard and lying bastard far outnumbered uses of bastard son. And notice something. In the nasty uses of the word, bastard is a substantive, a noun, a thing. Poor bastard. But in the only instances I could find where bastard was used to refer to illegitimate children, always sons, it was an adjective. Bastard sons. When in our English people refer simply to a bastard as a noun, a thing, it appears that they mean the mean version of that word. Did the original readers of the King James Version hear the word bastard that way when they read but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye unpleasant or despicable persons, and not sons. Hebrews 12.8 Bastard is the word the bishop's Bible had, the Bible the King James translators were asked to revise. It's the word Tyndall had before them. Was it a mean name in that era? The truth is, it's a bit difficult to discern from this distance what kind of emotional weight this word carried in the 16th and early 17th centuries. It isn't just language that changes over time, it's culture. 
illegitimate children used to face difficulties in Western culture that they just don't face anymore. Society has come to believe, in part because of stories of poor illegitimate children who are mistreated, like Oliver Twist in Dickens' famous novel, that it's wrong to punish children for who their father is or isn't. But it's still possible that the word itself used to be more neutral. And that is exactly what the authoritative and exhaustive Oxford English Dictionary says. Namely, that bastard was originally a neutral designation and used as such in legal contexts as late as the 20th century, but now tempered by the largely pejorative overtones of the word in modern use. It is now, they say, used as a term of abuse or contempt for a person, especially a man or a boy, now especially for someone who is callous or willfully cruel, or who acts ruthlessly out of self-interest. The Oxford English Dictionary prides itself in finding the very first recorded instance of a particular word or sense. And under this pejorative sense of the word, bastard, their first use comes from 1675. It was used by a man who was cursing his doctor for being a quacking bastard. So according to the best source I know, the King James translators did not use a word that was dirty or mean or pejorative in their day when they chose bastards. The word was neutral in 1611. It just meant illegitimate children. But how about today? Let's give it two acid tests first. Would your pastor ever use this word in a sermon outside of referring to its uses in the King James Version. Second, ask your teen Sunday school class to read Hebrews 12.8 in the King James and see if they snicker and look at one another. This word is a false friend, and it's not so much because modern readers will misunderstand the literal meaning, although I think a small percentage will indeed be confused, thinking, whoa, the writer of Hebrews was being awfully harsh. This word is a false friend because your teens will titter at the word, and teens in 1611 would not have. It would have sounded like the neutral designation it was, not like the bad word that it has become today. Is this a big deal? I don't think it is. But if you've ever worked in urban ministry as I have and been asked to use the King James Version as I have, you can't tell me you didn't secretly wish for this one word to be updated. And though this isn't a big deal, it's just a little bit more static in the audio Bible. A few more little cracks in the sidewalk in front of your house that you don't notice because you always walk there, but then your friend stumbles over them. How many of these little deviations from contemporary English norms should be permitted to stack up before it's time for a revision? That's the question, isn't it? The next bad word in the King James Version that we'll talk about is not a false friend. Everybody knows just what it means. It's not a dead word. Its first appearance comes in the mouth of a momentarily hot-headed David before he becomes king, incensed at the foolishness of Nabal, whose lands David and his ragtag band have been protecting. David vows, So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall, 1 Samuel 25, 22. Not a single other English translation I could find after the King James uses the phrase pisseth against the wall anywhere, except the Catholic Dewey Reams Bible of 1899. All the other translations go instead for males. But it has to be pointed out that everybody who pisses against the wall is exactly what the Hebrew says. You just know this, even if you don't know Hebrew. The King James translators would not have made this up. So sue me, but despite my rather uptight sensibilities and my own conviction that coarse talk is unbecoming of a Christian because of New Testament teaching on the subject, I admire the boldness of the King James translators. I'm going to have to go out on a limb here and say that I highly doubt he that pisseth against the wall was a more respectable and polite thing to say in 1611 than it is today. It was meant by David to be earthy, offensive talk, and I have to imagine that it was offensive to speakers of early modern English just as much as it is to us. It was uttered by a guy who was about to go splatter the blood of a couple dozen innocent boys and men on those very walls against which they had recently been urinating. It took the wise intervention of David's future wife, Abigail, to pull him away from his murderous and vindictive rage. In language, you have the concepts of sense and reference. The sense is the meaning of the word. The reference is the thing to which a given use of that word might point. You can talk about your love for trees and people know the sense, the meaning of tree, 
but then you can say, I used to swing on that tree and people are intended to pick up because of the sense and because of your circumstances, precisely which tree you're referring to. That's reference, sense and reference. Quite clearly, David's reference is to all the males in Nabal's household. So it's not wrong to go with males in your Bible translation. But David could have said males or men, and he didn't. He used that earthy, offensive, scatological phrase, and he did it on purpose. Now, I think David was sinning, both in action and in speech. Not everything that overall good Bible characters do is good. The narrative demonstrates this by the way even David comes to praise Abigail's intervention. But sense and reference aren't the only dimensions of language. You have to consider the feel, the connotation. My new Oxford American Dictionary calls piss vulgar slang. That's why all translations, aside from the King James Version, avoid it. But as best I can tell from the OED example uses of this word, which go way back in time to the early history of English, it has always been vulgar slang, and it was vulgar slang back in the days of the King James, too. I don't think it's a sin for translators to accurately report the feel of what David said. I think we, forgive me, emasculate David's speech when we go with males. But I stand only with the King James translators against pretty much everybody else on this one, and I totally get why they've done what they've done. It is indeed awkward in public reading of scripture to have to utter this phrase in public with women and children present. And Canadians, you know, they're so polite, they won't like this. I actually heard of a King James only preacher who, in order to get around the difficulty in public reading of this phrase, pronounced it as piseth against the wall. I also saw with my own eyes a rather infamous King James only preacher who took this phrase as normative, as indicating that this is divinely inspired instruction for the proper method men should use for urination. I wish I were making this up, and I wish I didn't have to talk about it, but someone's got to. The evil Rabshaka also uses this word, piss, in Isaiah and in 2 Kings when he threatens that the Jerusalemites he is besieging will soon have to eat their own dung and drink their own piss. Modern translations all opt for the less earthy and more medical urine rather than piss, but how many niceties of speech do you think Rabshaka was employing for this particular threat? Once again, I think the King James translators nailed it by choosing piss. I expected Robert Alter, who probably has the best ear for biblical Hebrew idiom among Bible translators, to use piss here, but he used urine. And man, I feel awkward talking about this. Why am I doing this? He did also use the word turd. I mention this because he did catch the feel that I feel in this passage, as again, I think the King James translators did. Piss, in the King James Version, is not a false friend any time it appears. It's not an error. It's a bold and, I'd argue, correct choice, even if other less offensive options are also definitely legitimate. It's also clearly a bad word in the King James Version. Next word, whore. Whore is one I won't spend much time on. When has whore ever been a neutral designation? Never. A whore has always been and will always be the nasty name for a person regarded as immoral, even by people who cauterize their consciences and call prostitution sex work that should not, they say, be stigmatized, but ask them if they'd be proud for their own daughter to choose prostitution on career day. Every God-given conscience on this planet knows that such a career is both degrading and dangerous. Though I need to point out that many young women are violently forced to endure it. They are not whores, but victims of sexual trafficking. If you're wondering, did whore once mean prostitute and only later come to refer to those engaging in promiscuity? As much as we know of the history of English, no. The word whore has always been capable of referring to both prostitutes and people, especially but not only women, who act like prostitutes. So modern English Bible translations, such as the English Standard Version, do definitely use this word, whore. It's not a dead word, it's not a false friend, but it's a shocking word, it's derogatory, it's a bad word, and it's meant to be. Some things are only wicked and must be derogated, disparaged, called out for the ugly things that they are. Selling your God-given body for sex is one of these things. It's a perversion of God's good gift of sex. There are a few places where the King James Version uses the word whore, but modern translations tend to go for prostitute instead, just because I think whore is so derogatory. A whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. 
Strange Woman is also a false friend, though a mild one most King James readers will know, I think. Perhaps I'll do a video on it later. But to refer so casually to a whore kind of grates on our ears. It feels almost cruel in a context like this one. So indeed, some modern English translations go with the still archaic harlot, others with the more contemporary prostitute, which the King James also uses one time as a verb. That word had only just entered English at the time, the OED suggests. But whore still shows up plenty in modern translations. That word by itself, especially in the phrase play the whore, occurs in the ESV even more than it occurs in the King James. And it's no surprise that this horrendous word, whore, gets applied to the most unimaginable betrayal there is, the spiritual betrayal of the Lord by his people. Going way back to the Wycliffe Bible, whose words I am liable to mispronounce, we have English speakers asking the fateful rhetorical question of Isaiah 121. How is the faithful city full of doom, made and whore? Doom was the word for judgment in Old and Middle English. It's where we get our word doomsday, meaning originally judgment day. And there is no sin more deserving of judgment than cheating on God. May God help us all to avoid spiritual adultery, to remain faithful to him. Two words left, and both are, I will argue, false friends in the King James. The next is bowels. Give it those acid tests with me. Would your pastor use the word in the normal course of a sermon without referring to its use in the King James? Would you cringe as looking ahead while reading out loud to the teens your peripheral vision encountered this word, bowels? Would you have to glare at the class clown as you read to make sure he didn't crack a joke? Bowels fails these acid tests, and yet there it is in black and white in the pages of the King James Version 39 times. Now the word actually appears in the NIV too, and the New American Standard Bible, and the ESV. Despite the titters that might result, these modern Bibles use the word bowels too, though far fewer times than the King James. Why? What's going on? Let's look at one of the places in the King James where bowels is a false friend. There's a one-chapter book in the New Testament in which it appears three times. The book of Philemon. Listen to those three times. We have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Here's another. Receive him, they're talking about Onesimus, that is mine own bowels. Another. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Clearly, we don't say this. If you ever were to need to mention your bowels feeling refreshed, it would only ever be at the doctor's office, most certainly not in church and not a couple times in a letter to a friend. The Greek word here is splunkna, which kind of sounds like a donut falling into your digestive juices. Splunk, I'm sorry, but it's true. BDAG defines it as the inward parts of a body, including especially the viscera, inward parts, entrails. And that's clearly the way we use the word today, though I just don't want to give an example or spend any more time on this word than I absolutely have to. But this word, in this sense of entrails or viscera or small intestines, does occur in the Bible, and that's why it gets used in modern translations a few times too. When Judas fell from the tree on which he had hanged himself, Peter says in Acts 1, all his bowels gushed out. That was splunkna. But Bedag has another comment that will explain why this word is used in the emotional letter of Paul to Philemon who owned the runaway slave Onesimus, who had then become a close friend of Paul. As often in the ancient world, inner body parts served as reference for psychological aspects of the seat of the emotions. In our usage, a transference is made to the rendering heart. So a translator has a problem. You can be literally accurate. You can force modern readers to travel into the biblical thought world and most likely confuse them if they lack a study Bible or an expository preacher. Or you can use the modern equivalent and everybody will get it on the first go-round. Heart. Both of these strategies are, in my judgment, legitimate in many places in the Bible. It can be a good thing to pull modern readers into the thought world of the Bible, to make them scratch their heads and look for a helpful footnote. This is why many translations use the word sheol. It's a hard word because we don't really have that concept that it names in our culture. People are going to have to do some study to understand it anyway, so translators kind of tip them off to that fact by using a word that most people don't know. But the potential for confusion with this particular word 
bowels is so great, the demand on tittering teens so towering that translators today have all chosen the latter option. I could see some translation going for receive Onesimus, that is my own viscera. We do today use the metaphor of things that are visceral. Using the word viscera would be confusing without being quite as distracting and quite as gross as bowels. But on balance, BDAG's suggestion is best, I think. I like the ESV's choice. I am sending him back to you, my very heart. That gets Paul's intended meaning across immediately. Now here's the question. Did the original readers of the King James understand bowels in Philemon to mean the inner seat of the emotions? I'd say that the Oxford English Dictionary speaks with an uncertain sound here. They suggest that, yes, such readers would have understood what's going on. They have a sense for this word that is now somewhat archaic, they say, considered as the seat of the tender and sympathetic emotions, hence pity, compassion, feeling, heart. This sense appears first in the Wycliffe Bible, they say, where I'm going to have to guess that he translated literally and therefore invented a new sense for this word. My best guess as to what's happening in English at the period of the King James is that long custom by the time of 1611 had made Christian people aware of what bowels meant in biblical times. So I'm going to guess the King James translators felt safe in assuming that they would not cause teen titters in church. And yet, now the word does cause precisely this, leading me to call it a false friend. I could see someone disagreeing with me here, I really could. But on balance and taking one thing with another, as I am often wont to do, it's going on my list as King James false friend number 41. Now the story you've all been waiting for, and boy do I have trepidation telling this. Please just send the kiddos to bed, even if it's 8.15 a.m., send them back in. I'm going to tell a true story featuring a hilarious misunderstanding of the word ass. I wouldn't tell this story if I didn't think it held a memorable and important lesson, okay? Dan Allender, the Christian psychologist, grew up as a complete heathen, right next door to the picture-perfect evangelical family, the Longmans. Little Tremper Longman, now a well-known evangelical Old Testament scholar, became best friends with his heathen next-door neighbor, Dan. And though Dan never followed Tremper in his faith, and though Dan literally never darkened the door of a church in his entire life, he actually followed Tremper to a sort of Christian college, as best I can tell, just so they wouldn't have to break up their mutual collection of LPs. This was the 1970s. Tremper was presumably well on his way to becoming a biblical scholar. Dan, on the other hand, got into the drug scene. And then he got deeper in. And then, as he tells it, and I will quote him, the point came in the context of the cartel that I worked with putting out a contract on a DEA agent. And all of a sudden, I went from being a middle-class drug dealer to being in the big time. I knew that either I was going to jail or I was going to die. I remember saying to Tremper, I want to go to church. And there was a move in my own heart to say, all right, God, if you're true, you're true, and I guess it's right, and you know, whatever. That night, and remember, this is his very first visit to church in his entire life, the pastor started talking about Balaam's ass. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what kind of religion have I gotten myself into that Balaam's ass is talking to him? And about halfway in the sermon, he changed to Balaam's donkey. Oh, it was such a relief. It was at this point I realized that all we're dealing with is the possibility that God could use animals and not body parts. Cue the laugh track. I am so sorry. I am indeed not into coarse jokes. I was recently voted most uptight white man in the Pacific Northwest 2020 by the Consortium of Independent Arbiters. I'm often the only guy at church with a tie, I promise, but I just die every time I think of this story. And we need to get this particular problem out into the open. Many churches face it. I talk about it in order to offer what I pray is wisdom for how to deal with it. Can you agree with me that this is the funniest false friend there is? It misled this poor drug dealer for a moment into weird places. I know what people will say. He should have known that the word ass means donkey. Every educated person knows this. Dan Allender's misunderstanding says bad things about him and about all drug dealers, not about the King James Version. And those people who say those things would be kind of right, onto something. But think with me here. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? Judges 1.14. I just got one question. Is it worth the risk? Is insisting that the King James Version should not be updated or replaced in your church worth the risk that 
Dan Allender will come into your congregation this Sunday? 1 Corinthians 14, the chapter I keep appealing to in all my work to show that edification requires intelligibility, addresses this very situation. Now, the situation is not perfectly parallel that I'm drawing, but I believe the passage still applies to the question I'm asking. Is it worth the risk? Listen to what Paul says. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. That was 1 Corinthians 14, 23 to 25 in the ESV. One reason that you don't use unintelligible speech in church, the most important reason, is that the body needs to be edified, and they won't be if they hear words they don't understand. But another reason is that an unbeliever might visit that day with his Christian boyhood buddy. Yes, obviously, Paul is contrasting the use of totally foreign languages with the use of the local vernacular. But I think the principle is so clear in this chapter, edification requires intelligibility, that it applies even to Elizabethan English versus our English. I think Elizabethan English can be usefully regarded as a different language than our English. I have to be so careful here, and I have been in all my writings, if people will read them carefully and charitably, which thankfully people on the internet pretty much always do. Obviously, the two Englishes overlap a great deal. They are largely mutually intelligible. We're talking about the edge cases, the places where, as the two Englishes pull apart like that Venn diagram, they no longer overlap. I just can't imagine Paul having insisted so frequently to the Corinthians that edification requires intelligibility and that we shouldn't trust to wise and eloquent words, being okay with a pastor in that church getting up and using Attic Greek that most people in the congregation didn't fully understand, when perfectly good Koine Greek, common Greek, was available. The question, which English Bible translation should we use, is not addressed in the Bible. Answering that question requires us to weigh different values against one another, like readability versus accuracy, or beauty versus clarity, but also tradition versus accessibility. Readability and accuracy are both important. Weighing them against one another is hard. Beauty and clarity and tradition and accessibility are all important. Weighing them against one another requires real wisdom. Because of 1 Corinthians 14, when it comes to ass versus donkey, and because of Dan Allender, I give the nod to the donkey. Dozens or maybe hundreds of well-trained, faithful English translators have sided with me. The American Standard Version of 1901 and the Revised Standard Version of 1952, both of which are revisions of the King James, they stuck with the word ass completely. The Catholic Dewey Reams does too. The mainline Protestant Common English Bible is the most recent major translation to use the word ass, but it uses it only thrice. The King James Version, however, uses it 150 times, which means 150 minor possible pitfalls for public reading of scripture. On balance, I really just preferred donkey. And lo and behold, donkey was not available in 1611. It did not enter English until the late 1700s. Ass was the common word for that animal when the King James was published. It isn't now. Very likely because people don't actually like to be forced to use possible double entendres every time they refer to common animals. Like the time a pastor's wife that I know half apologized for calling her dog a bitch, explaining quickly that that's just what you call them when you're a breeder, as she was. Ass, in the King James Version, is a mild false friend. Everywhere it might call up the wrong idea for a moment before you remember, oh yeah, they mean donkey. And for some people, nobody but God knows how many, it's a more major false friend. Because it won't just bring up the wrong picture. It'll bring up an offensively wrong picture, a disgustingly and confusingly wrong picture. Because it's a current bad word. It isn't worth the risk. I never said in this video that the King James translators did wrong to choose any of these bad words. Bastard was not a bad word when they chose it, for example. The fact that it is one now just makes it a false friend, which is not the King James translator's fault. So what lesson do I draw from this video that was so awkward for me to make and perhaps so awkward for you to watch? As always, let the Bible speak. When it speaks in earthy tones, speak in earthy tones. Somewhat controversially, I'm with BDAG in saying that Paul probably used the equivalent of the word crud in Philippians 3.8. But when the Bible doesn't speak in earthy tones, don't overlay earthy tones that 
aren't there by sticking with the translation whose words have picked up those tones over time. The Spirit did not intend for illegitimate children to make teens titter. He certainly didn't intend for the word donkey to make freshly converted drug dealers wonder if they'd wandered into weird cults. As our language continues to pull away slowly from that of the Elizabethans, little misunderstandings will inevitably continue to develop, and big ones. There will be little differences of nuance between the two Englishes. There will be little bits of meaning that are silently lost and others that are inadvertently gained. That's one reason why the King James translators had to revise the Bishop's Bible, which then wasn't even as old as I am now. Language changes. And if you want to translate the Bible into English, you can't do it once and for all, or bad words might happen.